Chris Fitzgerald and welcome to the third installment of the Jazz Bass Technique series. You may be wondering at this point why a Jazz Bass video tutorial would open with an excerpt from a Bach cello suite. The reason is that our subject for today is leverage in the left hand, which relates to the ability of the left hand to produce a full, round, and sustaining stop for melodic jazz pizzicato bass playing. Since the cello suites, were originally conceived to be played with a bow on a cello, an instrument which has far less string tension than a bass. And since the bow is an important component of note connection and melodic and lyrical sustain on any instrument of the violin family, playing this music pizzicato, taking the bow out of the equation, is a great acid test for left-hand technique on the bass, since any lack of technique will immediately result in a lack of sustain and note connection uh, that can't be compensated for with the bow once the initial attack has been sounded. For jazz players whose role in the ensemble demands that we play without the bow most of the time, a solid, efficient, and relaxed left-hand technique is an absolute must for the overall health of both the music and the player. In this installment of the series, we'll examine four basic aspects of left-hand technique. Left-hand shape, connection of the left hand to the larger muscle groups of the body, fixed left-hand position versus free or vibrato position, and tonal differences between playing with the tips and pads of the fingers. When talking about hand position for the bass, it's kind of important to backtrack and think of what you want to get out of any particular physical technique that you're considering. The main thing that I want to get out of any physical technique, really on any instrument, but specifically to the bass right now, is that I want my body to work in a relaxed, natural, and sort of organic way. In other words, I don't want my body to be doing something that is inherently uncomfortable to it. I want it to be doing something that is natural, to assume a position which is natural, since I'm going to be playing this way for hours and hours and hours, and I'd like to play for many, many years to come. So to start examining hand position, you notice I've got a, a prop here. It's just a regular orange from the supermarket. Uh, so to start talking about hand position for the bass, I want to create this hand position by recreating a very natural motion that the hand would normally make anyway. And it's the motion of catching a ball. So what I'm going to do is toss this orange up into the air with my right hand and catch it in my left. I'm not going to do anything special. I toss it, I catch it. Toss, catch. And now that I've got the orange in my hand, I'm going to sort of move it around. I'm not trying to squeeze it. I'm not trying to make orange juice. I'm just trying to make sure that I don't drop it, but that my hand is very relaxed. When I take the orange out of my hand, you see that the hand is basically in this shape. And this is almost, with one exception, it's almost the perfect shape for playing the bass. The fingers are curved, but not unnaturally so, like a claw. Uh, they're, they're extended, they're round, but the entire arm is relaxed. There's no tension in it at all. The one thing that I want to change, so, yeah. The one thing about this that I want to change is the shape of the thumb. And the reason I want to change that is because when the thumb is curved inward towards the fingers, the tendency is to squeeze the hand together like a fist. And if you take your right arm and your left arm and wrap your left fingers and thumb around your right arm like you're holding a baseball bat and squeeze, what you'll notice is there's a lot of tension in the left forearm right here. And in creating this tension and curving the fingers and thumb in that way, you've actually cut off the fingertips from the large muscle groups of the body, which is what we want to connect them to. So instead of that, I catch the orange, move it around, make sure I'm relaxed, remove the orange, and then I'm going to extend my thumb into what I like to call hitchhiking position. So it's extended outward so that it really can no longer squeeze. Catch turn, remove, and extend the thumb. And now that the thumb is in this position, it's no longer tempted to try to squeeze against the fingers because it's sort of locked out and in, in, uh, going the other direction. At this point, we can now take this hand position, which has almost no tension in it at all, and move it onto the base. And we'll start to look at how we'll connect that to the larger muscle groups of the body. Once you've found your left hand position, 
connecting the fingertips of the left hand to the larger muscle groups of the body, the chest, shoulder, back, is easy if you remember one simple thing, and that is to take the thumb out of the equation. If the thumb is in the equation and you put your hand on the neck and you're, you're still not thinking of connecting to the, to the body, but rather just pressing the note down, the temptation is always going to be to squeeze like a claw, to squeeze the life out of the ball. If you remember, on the other hand, just that your thumb is no longer part of the equation in terms of applying force to the string, you take your hand and your hand position, rotate your thumb out of the way like this. It was helping to hold the ball, but now you're taking it out of the equation. Now place your finger on the string and play a glissando. We're going to do it with each finger. Ring finger. And pinky. By taking your thumb out of the equation, you have forced your body to apply pressure to the string from the large muscle groups because once your finger is here the only way to really press it down since it doesn't have anything to squeeze against in the thumb is to pull backward with this sort of rowing motion from your torso from your chest shoulder and back and that's what presses the string down next we'll try moving we'll combine this motion this rowing motion of the large muscle groups of the upper body with another motion which is moving the arm up and down using again shoulder chest and back there's two ways to do it one is to move the entire arm including the upper arm like this and another is to rotate the assembly like this which basically looks like the elbow moving up and the elbow moving down so to practice this we'll take a short melody I'll use the opening phrase of my romance and take the first finger and play the opening phrase of the melody um, by pulling back with the rowing motion and then moving the arm up and down to move the finger into position to play the next note. At, notice that at no point is the thumb ever involved in this process. Now repeat it with the middle finger. Ring finger. This sort of continues our journey of trying to find the body's most natural way that it wants to do things without creating excess tension. Keep in mind that the more that we use the large muscle groups of the body as opposed to the smaller ones, the less tension we're going to have because it takes only a small percentage of the strength of these muscles to press down the bass string as opposed to the percentage of the forearm muscles it would take to squeeze every note down. And all you have to do is really try and squeeze a few notes out. Um, in other words, try this. Connect your elbow to your body and then try to play. So you're disconnecting all of this from the body and then try to play a note just by squeezing with each finger. And the amount of tension in the forearm is obvious. So rather than do that, keep the body open, take the thumb out of the equation, and just practice moving the entire arm instead. Our third topic of the day involves the two hand positions which most bassists use uh, situationally depending on what they're doing. A fixed hand position and free or vibrato position. It's important before we get into the specific discussion of both of these positions that they are not an either or proposition. Most bassists use them both depending on what they're doing, so it's not as though one is correct and the other is incorrect. It's just a matter of what the music calls for at any given time. So with that said, we'll start with fixed position. In fixed position, which is what's most normally taught to beginners in, for instance, the Samandal method, the left hand is already spread out beyond what it would be just from the normal cradling of a ball, which leaves us with a hand position looking sort of like this. In fixed position, the left hand is spread out so that it has already
created the distance needed to play an entire whole step in the lower portion of the bass neck without moving further except up and down. So the fingers are already the fingers are already spread out to the distance that are neat that is needed to play a half step between first finger and second finger and another half step between the second finger and the fourth, fourth finger. You'll notice that if you do this with your hand, you start with a relaxed hand as though you just caught a ball, and then spread the fingers out in order to play those half steps. Of course, this also depends on the size of your hand. But once you start to spread those fingers out, there is a little bit of tension in the forearm once those fingers are spread. But the idea behind fixed position is that you make as little motion as possible once you're in a position to play any note within that position. From one to two, the only motion that has to be made is that the second finger comes down. From two to four, same thing. Everything is already positioned where it needs to be except for the up and down axis needed to press the finger into the string. Notice also that in fixed position, if you watch the left arm, There's not much motion going on there because the arm doesn't have to move around in order to get the fingers into position to play. So in fixed position, we'll do a little bit of it on each string. Second string. Another aspect of fixed position which is worth noting is that uh, when the first finger plays, the other fingers are in position ready to play. Once the second finger plays, not only is the second finger pressing into the string, but the first finger is also still pressing into the string to make the distance that the second finger has to press the string down less than it would have been if the first finger were not there. Similarly, when the fourth finger plays, by the time the fourth finger plays, these two fingers behind it, one and two, are also still in position and still pressing into the string so that if, if you have to return back, they're already there. You don't have to do anything. Probably the greatest reason that fixed position is so commonly taught to beginners and so often used by bassists is for intonation and accuracy. Um, since the only motion that has to be made to play the next note inside that position is a very small, small as possible, up and down motion of the fingers rather than having to move side to side, um, once the position is in place and your technique is accurate, all you have to do is move very, very little. Um, to make the next note sound. This is in contrast to free or vibrato position. In free, I'm going to go ahead and call it free position, but in free position, the hand is basically relaxed in the way that it would be just when you're cradling a ball. And when each finger plays, it remains relaxed and not spread out as it would be, not, not as spread out as it would be in fixed position, so that the hand can rotate around the hand and of course, by connection, the arm can rotate around that finger to produce vibrato. Position, several things are important to note. One is that in order to play the same whole step that you did in fixed position, um, the arm must move in order to help position the finger to play the next note. So in fixed position, when we play these three notes, if you look at my forearm, it's hard to see it moving. In free position, even if I don't use vibrato, Watch the elbow. In 
free position, the arm must move in order to complete the half steps um, because otherwise the notes would be flat because the fingers aren't as spread out as they would have been in fixed position. Another aspect of free position, which is very important for pizzicato players, is that um, because the fingers play more or less independently, they don't remain down or don't have to remain down when the higher numbered fingers are playing. So when I play the second finger, because I want to be free to vibrate, the first finger is no longer pressing down. And if you remember the rowing motion that we talked about earlier, when I play the second finger now, not only is my hand free to vibrate, but the entire weight of my arm is on the finger that's playing. Which many people feel can give you a fuller, more complete stop than, especially when you don't have the bow to help activate the string, than when you're playing on the second finger and spreading the force that you're putting on the, on the string between two fingers means all of the force is on the note that's playing. And all of that um, force that's being applied is coming not only from the hand, but on the arm, from the arm, which has to move in order to put the finger in correct position to play. Um, free position is also used by pizzicato players for uh, techniques such as hammer-ons and pull-offs. If you're in fixed position, it's difficult to produce a hammer-on in which the hammered note, the second note, is anywhere near as loud as the first one because your arm is more or less immobilized by your hand being in this position. Whereas in free position, you have the motion of the arm and the distance of the finger that it has to travel to produce a hammer sound. A lot of force. Think, of, think about using an actual hammer to hammer in a nail. If you use a very small motion and just tap on the head of the nail, um, it takes a lot of strokes to get the nail to go down, whereas if you watch a professional carpenter, um, they can get a nail to go in in one or two strokes of the hammer because they're traveling a greater distance. Same with hammer-ons from free position. And you notice that all of this is propelled by the motion of the left arm and the distance between the finger and the string. So the advantages of fixed position, just to sort of summarize that, are going to be efficiency, very little motion is, is used, and intonation, because the intonation is already built into the shape of the hand. The advantages of free position will be the ability to use vibrato, because the hand is relaxed and the arm can rotate around it. ability to more easily produce really convincing hammer-ons. It's worth noting that the reason why fixed position is most commonly taught to beginners is because in free position um, it's a lot harder or at least it's a lot more complicated to play in tune because the entire apparatus of the arm, shoulder, and torso is involved in this distance between the note that the first finger plays and the finger has to move a lot further to reach the next half step than it does in fixed position. So free. the arm does not. Remember that most professional bassists use a mixture of these based on what the music is doing. The fourth and final segment of this episode regards the issue of playing with the tips of the fingers versus the pads of the fingers. And this issue has been much discussed between bass educators and bass students for many, many years. I think in the beginning it's important to clarify what we mean 
by the tip and pads of the fingers, and then we can go and talk about the differences after that. By the tip, uh, a common misconception is that the tip of the finger means the absolute point of the finger, the part of the finger that if you were going to poke someone with uh, trying to cause them pain, that you would do it with that part of the finger. That's the part of the finger directly under the fingernail. So if I were going to poke my base in a confrontational kind of way with the absolute tip or point of the finger, it would look like this. And it's a very, there's very little flesh between um, the outside of the skin of the finger there and the bone beneath it. And so it's a very, very hard surface. However, very few bases and none that I know personally um, actually play with that part of the finger. Most of the time when people talk about playing with the tip of the finger, they actually mean the front, the very front part of the pad, more like the area that you can see here where the indentation is on the finger rather than the point of the finger. So once we get that distinction out of the way, we can have a useful discussion about the tips and the pads. Um, the main technical understanding that you have to have about the tips and the pads is that it takes a different amount of force to play with the front part of the pad, which is what we're from now on going to call the tip, and the fleshy part of the pad further down the finger. And that the reason that you would choose to do those two things has to do with the sound that you're after. Neither, like with fixed and free position, neither of these things should be considered correct or incorrect technique. It's rather two different techniques which produce different results. Technically speaking, um, the main point that we need to remember is that playing the, the, the closer to the tip of the finger that you play, the less force you have to apply. And we'll discuss the tonal differences in a moment. But when you play close to the tip of the finger, you, you have less flesh between the bone underneath and the surface that's playing and so it takes less force to press down the string. An easy analogy we can do using another prop, this time a pencil. Uh, we'll call this the tip of the finger, which is actually the front of the pad, but we'll call this the tip of the finger. And we'll call this the pad further down on the pad, right about here. Um, w you could take a pencil and hold it strongly in your fist. And you could take the eraser into the pencil and someone, if someone would ask you, would you drop this into your palm with some force behind it? You'd say sure, because you know that the pencil, because there's enough surface area there, the pencil is not going to stab you. It's just going to slide up in your hand like so. So again, the eraser side of the pencil, no problem. However, if that same person said, okay, now turn the pencil around, sharpen the tip of that pencil, hold onto it really tight, would you drop your finger into your palm? And you'd say, of course not, because the, the point of the pencil doesn't have enough surface area to dissipate the force. And you would just get stabbed with a piece of lead. Playing with different parts of the finger is very much like that. It, the closer to the tip of the finger that you play, the less force that you have to use. The further from the tip of the finger that you play, the more force is required to press the string down to get a complete stop. Beyond that, everything is about the tonal differences between playing with what we're going to call the tip of the finger and the pad of the finger. First thing you notice is probably that on the E string, the tip and the pad sound the most markedly dif um, different. When you play with the tip of a finger, there's less surface area on the string and the sound produced tends to be very clear. play further down on the fleshy pad part of the finger. Uh, often jazz bassists will flatten their fingers out a bit to get the effect. The sound tends to be buzzier and growlier, especially on the A and E strings. It's a 
sound that a lot of jazz basses strive for on those lower strings especially. Listen to the difference. So here's tips. Versus pad, and I'm going to use a flattened, I'm going to flatten out the middle finger a little bit to sort of heighten the effect. So the tips get a very clear sound, whereas the pad gets a growl, a buzzy sort of growl sound. Especially these low notes. Tip, pad, tip, pad. As with almost anything, neither of these things is right or wrong, and I don't believe they should be taught that way. They should be taught as different techniques designed to get different sounds. As long as the player realizes and has built into their technique the notion that when you play with the tips, you don't need as much force to get a complete stop as when you play with the pads, you need a lot more force to get a complete stop. Um, everything else involved between should I play with the tip, should I play with the pad? The answer is yes. You should play with the tip when you need the sound, a very clear sound. You should play with the pad if you want that more diffuse, buzzy growl sound. And just realize that in, in your technique you have to build in the amount of force that's needed to make that work. Think again. Tip doesn't require much force and you wouldn't, you wouldn't in all you know, good conscience use much force. Whereas pad, use as much force as you need to get the complete stop. So in summary, in this installment, we've talked about four aspects of double bass left hand technique. Um, hand position, arm weight, fixed versus free position once we've placed our hands on the bass, and the difference between playing with the tips or the pads of the fingers. Uh, I'd like to conclude this episode with uh, a playing ex excerpt which mirrors the one which began it. If you'll remember in the beginning we began with an excerpt from a Bach cello suite and I'd like to conclude with something very similar actually, I, I think it's very similar, uh, a bebop head, uh, Donna Lee, in which it's played in the style and tempo and sort of neo rubato feel of the Bach cello suite which will sort of accentuate how similar the bebop and Bach style um, are in one sense, but also give us uh, a tempo in which we can actually see what the left hand is doing. And as you watch and listen to it, um, I hope you'll keep in mind um, all of the things that have been talked about in this installment, all of the different aspects of left hand technique, and notice how all of them are used at some time or other in both pieces, um, because the music requires different things at different times, so it's good to have all of these techniques under your belt and be able to use them anytime you wish. That's it for this episode. Thanks for tuning in and I hope to see you next time.